welcome to the Pascal Lectures uh, on Christianity and the University for the year 2010. My name is uh, Robert Mann. I am the chair of the Pascal Lectures Committee, and I'm delighted to see so many of you out tonight on a February evening to understand something about our universe of wonder and mystery, as we will hear about uh, more momentarily. These lectures are named after the uh, philosopher and mathematician Blaise Pascal, whom, as you will note from your program, uh, lived from 1632 to 1662 and accomplished many interesting things and was very interested in the relationship between how we understand our natural world and how we understand God and, and, and our world in a theological context and framework. Uh, before we go ahead and introduce our speaker and the main event, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, first, I would like very much to thank uh, the Reed Trust, the Priscilla and Stanford Reed uh, Trust Foundation that has made a generous financial contribution that is very much in part responsible for making uh, these lectures possible this evening. So that's all I have to say at the moment. I would now like to call upon the Associate Vice President Academic at the University of Waterloo, Jeff McBoyle, who will introduce our speaker. So, Jeff. So, this is... Good evening, all. The American poet and novelist Jean Tomer wrote the following... Beyond plants are animals. Beyond animals is man. Beyond man is the universe. End of quote. The heavens have fascinated us since the dawn of our existence. Yet within the last few decades, we have learned more about the universe than in all other centuries combined. Over the last 20 years, the Hubble Space Telescope has allowed us to see the cosmos that is beyond us and give us a chance to decipher its workings. On average, every day since Hubble's launch, there have been more than 40 citations in scientific papers to the use of Hubble-based data. From such data, we have a greater appreciation of the universe. The appreciation of the size of the Milky Way. We have appreciation of how black holes relate to galaxies. And we hear about the speeding up of the expansion of the universe. The universe is large. Yet from telescopes, we can see galaxies emerging and stars dying. At the same time as we see in this photograph here, we see beauty in form, color, and brilliance of the images. One British journalist described Hubble's images as, quote, possibly the greatest artworks of our time, end of quote. To many, these images, although incredible, raise questions about our view of ourselves, our place in the universe, Will the James Webb Space Telescope, the Hubble replacement that should be in place by 2014, will it allow astronomers to look at galaxies forming in the first million years? What new images and systems and mysteries will this data bring? Tonight, we have the speaker to address some of these issues. (laughs) <laughs> Dr. Jennifer Wiseman has studied star-forming regions of our galaxies. While an undergraduate, she, descri- she discovered the comet Wiseman Skiff. After completing her doctorate in astronomy at Harvard, she carried out research at the National Radio Observatory and at John Hopkins University. Currently, Dr. Wiseman is chief of the laboratory of exoplanets and stellar astrophysics at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. The Exoplanets and Stellar Astrophysics Laboratory studies the formation 
and evolution of stars and planetary systems. Its research also contributes to the search for Earth-like planets and habitable environments around other stars. Tonight, Dr. Wiseman will deliver the 29th Pascal Lecture. Her talk is entitled, as you can see, Universe of Wonder, Universe of Mystery. Please welcome Dr. Wiseman. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's an honor for me to give the Pascal Lectures here. And it's also an honor for me just to be able to share with you some of the excitement that we are gathering by doing observations of the universe using some of the best telescopes that we've ever had in the history of humankind. So I want to share with you some of that excitement tonight and sort of see where that leads us in terms of thinking about what it means um, for us. How many of you are astronomers? Anybody? A few? How many of you have ever actually been able to look through a telescope in your life? Good. Okay. How many of you have been able to go out someplace really dark, um, you know, uh, out of the way of city lights on a clear night and just enjoy looking up at the sky with your own eyes? I hope all of you. And, you know, sadly, that's, that's a, an experience that many people on the planet these days never get in their entire life. And they are missing a, a, an experience of really understanding the beauty of the universe that we live in. So we will, uh, uh, in any case, try to go on a little tour of our own, of the universe. Uh, this is a galaxy, and a galaxy is uh, composed of hundreds of billions of stars, typically in this kind of spiral galaxy, and a huge volume of gas and dust in these spiral-type galaxies. And some of them, there's so many stars together in their core that it looks like just a blended glow of light. They are fabulous uh, uh, creations, and we are going to see many of them this evening. To get started, I want us to think a little bit philosophically about this. Um, the great philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote that two things, when he considered all things, he said two of them continue to fill his mind with ever-increasing awe and admiration. And the two things that he could think of in that realm are the starry heavens above and the moral law within him. Those are the two things that he had, uh, um, I'd say, an interesting time contemplating. And that is sort of what we're contemplating tonight because the lecture series here is the Pascal series on Christianity and the university. So our astronomical science we'll talk about t tonight here has to do with the science part of the university. And the moral law within has to do more with the theological side of the university and of our own contemplations. So this is a good quote for us to begin with. It's written on his tombstone. So let's get started. Galaxies are amazing, uh, amazing things, as I mentioned to you. They are full of stars, full of, gal of, of uh, gas, full of activity. New stars are forming. Old stars are dying. Black holes in the middle are munching stuff up. And I think that's a good place to start our little tour. I'd like to spend the first part of this lecture just going on a little universe tour. Unfortunately, we don't have a spaceship yet that can take us quickly and efficiently through the universe. So we're going to gaze at it from different perspectives, not from different directional perspectives, but from different qualitative perspectives. And many of the images that I'm going to show tonight come from this particular telescope, which is called... Ah, very good. You're very bright. The Hubble... <laughs> <laughs> the Hubble Space Telescope, which is called the Space Telescope because it is in... Yeah, very good. Okay. Um, so this telescope is a satellite that is put up in low Earth orbit to get it above the clouds, as you can see from below. And those of you who are really on the ball will say, how did that picture get taken? Who took this picture? Um, 
And the answer is that this was shortly after one of the servicing missions. The, the space shuttle, um, for several times, has gone up to this orbiting telescope and so that astronauts could refurbish it, put in new instruments and, and so forth, and fix it up. And then right after the shuttle will release the telescope, there's often a time for photography. So, uh, so this is one of those pictures. So let's do go on a little tour of the universe, if my computer will allow it. Um, I want to explain a little bit about this, the, uh, the improvements that we've experienced over the last few hundred years. It was mentioned earlier that 400 years ago, Galileo first pointed a telescope at the heavens in such a way as to record what he saw. There's a lot of controversy over, you know, was that really the very first telescope? And I think the answer is no. Is that the very first time anyone ever actually pointed a telescope at the sky? And I think the answer to that now is no. But I think we're all agreed, I think, the historians, that, that Galileo was the first one to record what he saw over time in such a way that it could be uh, reproduced, you know, sort of scientific observations of the heavens the first time. And that happened in the early 17th century. You can see over time the improvements in the telescopes over time, eyepieces, better uh, optical devices. Here's a 21-inch telescope, a 48-inch telescope used by William Herschel, a 72-inch telescope. Then we get to the 20th century, we have a 100-inch telescope. These sizes are the, the, the width or the aperture of the opening, of the lens opening for light to come in. So the wider you're collecting aperture, the more sensitive your telescope is. So we get bigger and bigger telescopes. It's very hard to make these mirrors and these lenses. They have to be polished to an extreme amount of accuracy, and that's why it's very difficult to make large ones. Mount Palomar's 200-inch. Then we get into the multimeter telescopes. And keep in mind that this little curve of improvement, sensitivity improvement over the eye, is on a logarithmic scale. So each one of these little uh, uh, marks here is 10 times better than the one before it. So, you, you know, each one of these, we're, we're, we're getting to orders of magnitude improvement over the previous um, device. And, of course, just general photography was here. Nowadays, we're using electronic CCDs to record things. This is the Hubble Space Telescope and the improvement that you get. You see, this is 10 to the 10 times better than the bottom of this chart. So many orders of magnitude improvement over what your eye can do. And so the Hubble was an, a tremendous improvement when it was launched in 1990. And then we have just did a servicing mission called SM4, servicing mission four, which is off the chart, as you can see. So, uh, so that has made our space telescope really better than it's ever been before and, and it's really at the apex of its capabilities even though it's just about 20 years old and these are some examples of some of the uh, images that the telescope has brought us and we'll talk more about that in our little tour. So our first perspective that I'd like us to look at the universe from is the perspective of magnitude. These are qualitative perspectives although magnitude can be quantified as well. So let's see what I mean by magnitude. And I always think a picture is worth a thousand words. So um, here's a picture of a cluster of stars. It's called the Sagittarius Star Cloud in our own galaxy. And I like it because it just gives you a, a, a visual picture of what stars really look like when you can see them as they are in dense clusters in our own galaxy. Now, we see bright stars and dim stars in this group of stars. And there are thousands upon thousands of stars in this picture in this tiny, small cluster. Imagine this extrapolated across our entire galaxy. The um, brightness and dimness of a star can often uh, be confused with how distant that star is from us. So a bright star might be brighter because it's intrinsically brighter or because it appears brighter than the others because it's just closer. In this case, this is all within one cluster of stars that are associated with each other. So they're at basically the same distance from us. And that means that the brighter looking stars really are intrinsically brighter. The dimmer ones really are intrinsically less bright. And, and so it shows you the variety of stars what else do you notice about these stars in this picture? Anybody? Different colors? 
Ah, yes, there are beautiful different colors. I think they look like gemstones. So we see um, reds and blues and yellows, and they indicate the different temperatures of the atmospheres and stars that are at different phases of their life or that they are in different sizes. So they have different um, temperatures and lifespans based on their mass. There are hundreds of billions of stars in a typical spiral galaxy. And uh, we think our own spiral galaxy looks something like this. It's hard for us to to really come to this uh, understanding of our own galaxy because we cannot get out of our own galaxy to look back and take a picture. We don't have that kind of, of, of capability yet in space travel. But by looking from our own location, which we now believe is about here in our own galaxy, and by looking around in all directions through very careful observations, we believe that we are also in this spiral type of galaxy with several of these spiral arms. The spiral arm where our sun is located has been named the Orion arm. And there are other arms of the galaxy as well, the Perseus arm, the Sagittarius arm, and so forth. There's a galactic center with an extreme high density of stars. And by the fast motions and orbits of stars in the center of our galaxy, it's been determined that there's very likely a black hole in the center of our galaxy, as there are in the center of many other galaxies. Black holes are extreme concentrations of mass that pull in other stars and material and just keep increasing in mass. And by doing so, they increase their gravitational uh, pull to such extremes that anything that gets too close to it will simply fall in, including light. Light cannot escape. If you get close, a little bit close, but not too close, you can end up in orbit around the black hole. And that is how you can discern that there's one there by measuring the, the velocities of motion around the black hole. So we believe our galaxy looks like this. And we have a little uh, tiny dwarf galaxy next to us in our neighborhood. The entire galaxy um, is about 150,000 light years across. That means if you're on one end, it takes 150,000 years for the light from the other side to get across to you and so forth. It's a big place. All right. Here's what a galaxy look, can look like if you look on the, at them edge on. So, you know, galaxies, as we look out at other galaxies, can be in any orientation relative to us. So this would be another spiral type galaxy, but looking at it um, edge on, and I show this picture just so you can see how flat these spiral galaxies can be. There are other types of galaxies that are more spherical, but these flattened types um, can have a little bit of warped structure in them. They're full of dust in their, between the stars in their spiral arms, and you can see that as these dust lanes across here. And then you see this general glow of stars around the center of the galaxy. That's called the halo. It's basically a, a spherical distribution of stars and the starlight basically blends together into this glow. This is one of my only number charts, but I just wanted to put a few numbers down on paper um, just so you get a sense for big numbers. Um, Earth is 150 million kilometers from our own star, the sun, and Pluto is about 6 billion kilometers of the, uh, from the sun. So that's just our own solar system. It becomes clumsy to use these numbers. One light year, which is the distance that light travels in a year, is about 10 million million kilometers. And our nearest star is 38 million million kilometers away. So we, we really jump to light years as the unit of distance pretty quickly. Our nearest star is about 4 light years away. That's Proxima Centauri. And we have a sense that 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 star, even being so close, we're looking at it as it was four years ago, not as it is right now. It's taken that long for the light to get to us. Since we, I talked about our own galaxy, but our nearest neighbor spiral galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest big grand spiral galaxy. And that's two million light years away. So when we look at that Andromeda galaxy, which you can see with a good backyard telescope, you're looking at it as it was actually two million years ago. It's taken that long for the light to get to us. And now we're actually seeing galaxies with, with powerful telescopes at distances of several billion light years away. So you're really using astronomy as a time machine to see things as they were billions of years ago and comparing them uh, to how they are now. And in terms of numbers, we believe there are, you know, at least 100 billion galaxies in our visible universe. And of course, if there are about 100 billion stars on average in each one, there are roughly 10,000 billion billion stars in the universe. It's really quite a lot when you think that our sun is just one of them. Okay. 
So this is another cluster of light here, but these are not stars. These are, in fact, galaxies. This is the ultra Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and this was taken by pointing the, teles the Hubble Space Telescope at a position in the sky where there weren't very many nearby stars to, to uh, basically um, saturate the, uh, the camera and instead pointed it to a, an area where they could leave it on for days and days and collect light to see the dimmest things in the most farthest uh, reaches of the, of the universe that could be seen. And this was produced as this final result, which is basically a collection of galaxies, which was not unexpected, but it is quite amazing to look at in any case. Every one of these little blips of light is not noise or, or static. These are, in fact, galaxies, each with their own hundreds of billions of stars. And some of them are closer so that you can see more of the structure, like the spirals. And some of them are much more distant. Some of them are reddened objects that appear reddened due to their motion with the expansion of the universe. We get a red shifting of the light, which makes the galaxies appear redder. Imagine this extrapolated over the entire sky. This is only a sort of pencil beam uh, area on the sky. So if you imagine this extrapolated over the entire sky, I hope you have a sense of amazement at the universe that we are a part of. We're just on one of these little spiral galaxies in a vast and incredible universe. Let's look for the perspective of beauty. I'm back to my stars. I really like the beauty of the star cluster and I like the different colors, but we've already discussed that. They look like gemstones to me. Um, I see beauty in galaxies. Here's another one and I like this particular one because of its symmetry. Um, it's a beautiful spiral, a beautiful pinwheel shape beautiful arms and I like the background in this you know the sort of background noise in this galaxy are also beautiful galaxies there's a nice spiral here here's one with a barred center which is a common feature in some spiral galaxies here's a reddened galaxy here and here and here so even the background noise in this picture are countless other galaxies giving you just an incredible sense of the beauty of these enormous features in the cosmos it's an awe-inspiring picture and astronomers feeling that sense of poetry and beauty have named it NGC 1309. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I uh, gave a talk the other evening at, at uh, McMaster in Hamilton and uh, one student came to talk to me afterwards. She was very excited about this concept of beauty and she said that she herself had been working on artwork when she uh, saw these Hubble Space Telescope images, which you can see on a website called hubblesite.org, and she was so inspired by what she saw that she, what, she was uh, painting things around the theme of these galaxies and features seen with telescopes. So she sent me this picture of her artwork. She said seeing these spiral galaxies made her feel a sense of freedom and a feeling of wanting to dance and, and enjoy the freedom and the beauty that she saw in these features. So I asked her if I could show her artwork and she was delighted. So Mashid Fatih is sharing her art with us and she's a PhD student in uh, materials uh, science and engineering at McMaster. The beauty does inspire music, it inspires poetry, it inspires art. I hope it inspires you. Okay. All right, what about in our own galaxy? This is a, a region of stars that's familiar to many in our own galaxy. Anybody know what this constellation is? Orion, Orion that's right. So here's Orion's belt and sword. Now, I, don't, I, I sometimes resent that I have to see in the constellations what somebody, you know, many years ago saw in that. And so what I see in this constellation is a kite. Here's the kite and here's the tail right here. But um, <laughs> here's the string down here. But anyway, um, this is Orion, this star up here. Anybody know what that is? Bright? Betelgeuse? Anybody heard of that? Okay, so this star is called the Red Giant. It's, it's an aging star. It means it's growing unstable. Its outer atmosphere is expanding and it's getting ready for a supernova explosion, which will be quite spectacular when it happens, but it could be uh, any time within the next few hundred thousand to a few million years from now. <laughs> <laughs> so you still have to do your problem sets and study for your exam. Okay, here's uh, Rigel down here. 
But this box uh, signifies a, a region around some of these stars that is well known for having fuzzy, fuzzy emission that's called the nebulae. And ne anytime astronomers see something fuzzy, they call it a nebula. So uh, if we go down in here, this is an Ori the Orion Nebula, and the Horsehead Nebula is up here. But let's hone in down here. This, is, this picture is taken from a telescope on the ground, a good one. But if you hone in this region with the Hubble Space Telescope, you see uh, beautiful colors of this Orion Nebula. And it's beautiful in its color, which is by, by the, the uh, results of the massive stars that have recently formed. So in these dense clouds, you have continual star formation if there's enough material in these clouds. Cl these interstellar clouds of gas and dust can be quite turbulent. And if you get little eddies of gas that have enough density, they will collapse under their own weight and form new stars. All a star is is simply a ball of gas, mostly hydrogen, that's collapsed under its own weight. And if there's enough mass, the pressure in the core will allow the hydrogen to fuse into helium, and that reaction releases light. So you get light from this ball of gas. That's what a star is. And if it's a big enough star, that light will be powerful enough to ionize the surrounding gas out of which it formed, and that ionization creates colorful, visible light often. So we see this beautiful lit up nebula. Over time, the light and, and stellar winds from these stars will blow away the surrounding gas and you'll just be left with the stars. But behind this complex is a much larger dark cloud where young stars are just beginning to form. They haven't yet turned on. They're called protostars. And I studied the region around this with radio telescopes for my own dissertation to study how those protostars are starting to form. The perspective of progression, let's move to that next. Um, here are our galaxies again, but I mentioned to you that some of them are more distant and some of them are closer. Astronomers can use techniques to discern which of them are actually closer and which of them are actually more distant. It's a difficult technique, but there are several that have been devised to discern that distance metric. But here's some of those that have been um, discerned to be the most distant. They're circled here in these little green circles. I don't know if you can see the circles. Some of them are magnified here. You see they all look very reddened. Now reddening can be caused by just a lot of dust in the galaxy, but in this case the reddening of these objects are caused by their, the red shifted appearance of the light. Again, when something is moving away from you, the light you receive, you receive it at a lower frequency than, than when it was emitted because the light wavelengths get stretched out along with the expansion or along with the motion of the object. And in this case, the object is being carried along with the expansion of space. So we receive reddened light from the most distant galaxies. And you can tell by doing detailed studies of these distant galaxies that they are different from the galaxies in our nearby universe, nearby to us in space and time and from our own. How are they different? They are smaller. They contain uh, very little of this beautiful spiral structure. They are kind of ratty looking. Um, we get a lot of merging in the early universe to create over time these larger um, ordered spiral structures. But in the early universe, we don't have so much of that yet. We still have ratty sort of pre-galaxies forming. They have almost entirely hydrogen and a little bit of helium because it takes generations of stars to produce the heavier elements, carbon and iron, things that we are very happy exist in our own galaxy and our own solar system. Those things didn't exist in these early galaxies because it takes time. Stars are factories that are producing through these inner fusion processes in their core these heavier elements and it hasn't had time for that to happen yet in these distant galaxies. This is what I mean by progression. There are some people right here um, in the physics and astronomy department that I had lunch with today who are studying these early galaxies and early clusters and groups of galaxies and how they differ in some ways from the clusters and groups of galaxies in the more nearby universe. Here's in our own galaxy a, a progression of a star in terms of it getting to the end of its life. When a star uses up all of the hydrogen in its core, it can become unstable. And that instability will eventually result for a very large star in an explosion that's called a supernova. So this is the result of a supernova explosion of a star that happened about a thousand years ago. I think it was in 1059. 
um, AD, and this explosion was observed by Chinese astronomers and recorded. And other astronomers of that period, or sky watchers, I should say, from have watched it ever since as the debris of this explosion has expanded out into space. We now call it the Crab Nebula. And it's very beautiful in this picture. But you can see how the material from inside the star, where fusion turns hydrogen to helium and eventually into heavier elements, can then disperse this material over a, to a wide uh, area around the star and into what we call the interstellar medium, seeding it, seeding it with the heavier elements that will then go into the next generation of stars that form out of this material. Here's a picture using our new camera, one of our new instruments on the Hubble Space Telescope. Here's another remnant of a supernova, another supernova remnant. And we're going to hone in now quite on part of this supernova remnant to look at it spectroscopically, meaning we're going to take the light, stretch it out into its constituent color components, and see if we can see evidence of different uh, of elements in, in the actual spectrum to see what is being spewed out in the supernova remnant into the surrounding medium. So here we have um, the spectrum from this supernova remnant. And when you spread out the light and look at the spectrum, you see evidence here of carbon and oxygen. These are both products of fusion in, within stars. So uh, it's just a graphic example of what happens when a star explodes and seeds its surrounding environment with heavier elements. And then finally, looking at progression, we can look at the early universe. Um, this is a map of the full sky projected onto a, a plane here. This was taken with a very special telescope called the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP. What that means is that it's looking at something called the cosmic microwave background emission. This is the background light left over from the Big Bang. So just shortly after the very beginning of our universe, the very uh, energetic beginning, there's remnant radiation that was predicted that would be there if there was such a beginning. It was found in the 1970s and, and resulted in a Nobel Prize. And then over time, the details of that background radiation have been studied. Now, with maps like this, astrophysicists are comparing these slight temperature variations as you look across this microwave background emission. And that's what the colors here represent. And as they measure the sort of spatial frequency of these temperature variations, they can compare that to where in our modern universe where we see clusters of matter and clusters of voids of matter. So this would represent what eventually would become regions where matter would condense, galaxies would form, and today we see honeycomb structures of galaxies um, around in the universe in every direction we look. We can compare the spatial structure of galaxies today and their distribution with the distribution of temperatures in the, in the very beginning of the universe and correlate that to see the entire history of the universe fitting together in a beautiful story. I find that quite incredible. So here we are. If you think of this as a timeline, here's that telescope or any telescope or us represented here. Looking back in time, if this is the timeline here, pretend like this is extrapolated into a whole sphere. It's very hard to... Uh, to represent space and time in, uh, in a picture. But uh, if we're here in time and we're looking back, we're seeing nearby galaxies that are fully formed and mature. We're seeing early galaxies here that were not so fully formed and early stars and the development of stars and galaxies and the planets around those stars. And then as we look early on, we even get to a point where we can't see stars anymore. And of course, there's that cosmic microwave background radiation toward the very beginning of time and space. And then there's a period before that where we can't see anything, but we, we know that there must have been an energetic beginning here. So this is a, cosmic a, a graphic rep representation of the cosmic history. And what they're also trying to show here is, is expansion and acceleration. There's actually been noted an acceleration to this expansion, which we'll talk about in a minute. All right, a little bit on activity. Uh, we notice, as I said, that galaxies often merge, especially in the, in the early universe when the universe was smaller. The gravitational pull of galaxies can sometimes overcome that large-scale expansion. So we have examples of merging galaxies. Here's another pair that mer got a little too close, and so it's too hot to handle. They are uh, merging 
uh, and they've started to lose their individual structure and that turbulent uh, attraction that they have. This is what I call a hot date. They are, they are, uh, they are uh, stirring up new star formation in here. So the, the uh, hot spots here are, are vigorous regions of star formation that have been incited by the turbulence caused by the merging of these two galaxies. Sometimes this uh, just goes way too far. And so these are two galaxies that have basically uh, gone uh, through one another as they merge, leaving a stripped off spiral arm structure that's now just an orbiting ring around the sort of core halo of one of the other galaxies. We see a few of these strange objects out there that are results of mergers. And then when we look out to distant galaxies, we see a lot of activity going on in galaxies yet today. So here's a representation using these, of these radio telescopes that I sometimes use out in New Mexico, the very large array. And of course, they're seeing the sky in radio wavelengths that we don't see with our eyes. However, you can represent what we see at those frequencies and wavelengths by matching them to some visible color so you can see. So that's what's been done here. These are galaxies smattering in blue back in here, represented that way, including this one. But some galaxies have very active black holes at their core where material that's falling in doesn't all fall in. Some of it gets caught up in magnetic fields around the black hole and gets shot out the poles in these enormous jets that are much larger than the galaxy itself. So that's what this is. It's a bipolar jet from an active galactic nucleus. A lot of activity going on in galaxies of that sort. And we see the same phenomenon around individual little stars that are forming. They have jets as well. In our own galaxy and within other galaxies, we often see activity in terms of star formation. So looking in different wavelengths of light, here's visible light and infrared light um, at star forming regions. This one in the um, Eta Carina star forming region, we see uh, all sorts of activity of young stars forming. And once stars form, they tend to, again, blow away some of the surrounding gas, even as they ionize it, leaving these amazing sort of column-like structures around that are quite magnificent to see. You've probably seen this one, but this is the Eagle Nebula where bright stars have formed up here. The starlight is sort of blowing away the the less dense material, leaving for a little bit longer the denser pockets and shadows behind them. So that makes these dense columns. Well, it's this denser gas where young young new stars can still form, lower mass stars. And so lower mass stars are still forming in these columns, but it's impossible to see that very well with regular visible light telescopes because of all the dust that's just simply blocking the light. We use infrared telescopes and radio telescopes to peer into these things because the light in those wavelengths can get out. So what happens when we look at these columns with an infrared telescope? Well, it looks like this. Can you still see the columns? All right, but it's allowing us to peer in them pretty well so we can see hot spots like right here. That's a protostar forming region and here and here where young stars are uh, actively forming and heating up their surrounding cocoons. So um, we use different tools to do detective work here. And yet smaller stars that lose their outer atmospheres don't explode, but they make these beautiful, uh, again, we call them nebulae, but beautiful structures of, of puffing out their outer atmosphere. Someone thought this looked like a cat's eye. All right, and the final perspective I want to look at right now is called mystery. And the mystery is that we don't know a lot. <laughs> that's, no mis- that's no surprise. Um, we see motions in galaxies, rotational motions, Uh, that indicate that there are gravitational pulls and attractions from matter that we don't see. We don't know what it is. We can account for the stars. We can account for the dust and the gas, just about everything we can think of. And it's not nearly enough to account for the amount of mass that we see at work in gravitational actions. We call that dark matter. We know it's there, though. We can measure its effect indirectly. Uh, Matter can actually bend light if there's enough of it. So when you look at a cluster of galaxies where you can see some of the galaxies, but there's a whole lot of dark matter in there that you can't see, you can tell that it's there by looking at the distortions that those galaxies make on background galaxies. When the background light from galaxies in the far distance comes past galaxies in the near distance, that background light can get bent and distorted depending on the amount of mass in the near-term cluster of galaxies, in the near-space galaxies. 
And so we can actually measure the amount of distortion and they've colored that kind of in a bluish hue here. So when the background galaxies have a lot of distorted shapes, they'll, they color this a little more bluish than when there's less. So you can actually measure where the dark matter is in the foreground galaxy cluster, even if you can't see the dark matter itself. It's a clever, complicated, but clever little trick there. And then I mentioned the dark energy, which is the latest mystery. We know, we've known for decades that the universe is expanding, that galaxies appear to be moving apart from each other because they're caught up in this large-scale expansion of space. But it was always thought that gravity, which is the only thing we understand that works on those large scales, would eventually either just slow this expansion down or even turn it around into a big crunch. Those are the two options that we had when I was in graduate school thinking about these things. A few years ago, it was determined through careful observations of galaxy velocities and motions that the universe expansion is actually accelerating. And we don't know what causes an acceleration over that uh, scale. Is it something we don't quite understand about gravity? Is it something else? We call it dark energy right now because we don't know what it is. So we got our dark matter. We got our dark energy. There's lots of work to do for astronomers in the future. In fact, if you add up the sort of matter and energy budget, uh, if you can think of things the, in, that, in those terms, um, we understand sort of this much. Baryons are kind of the normal material that we understand, elements and so forth. And then there are uh, neutrinos. We think we kind of understand that. And then we have the dark matter that we don't really understand, but we do understand how it works. So now it seems almost normal compared to dark energy. So we don't understand what dark matter is. That's 22% of this budget. Dark energy is about 73%. So this kind of looks like bad news in the U.S. budget right now, where this much we have no control over, and Congress fusses over this much. Um, so there's still a lot we don't know. We need humility. Okay. And the last mystery I want to mention tonight, but I'm going to talk about in more detail tomorrow, is about whether there are planets outside our solar system, and especially planets that could support life. We've always wondered that in science fiction, but now we can actually start to answer that question. We're starting to find planets around other stars. Since there are, in fact, 200 billion stars in our own galaxy alone, and these are stars here taken with an infrared ground-based telescope, so you can actually see stars even in the, the lane of our Milky Way that's normally very dusty to see stars. These are stars, just to give you an example of this ocean of stars we live in. And one of them is our sun. So if the sun has planets, and we know that one of those planets has life, this one, you know, is it possible that there are other planets in the universe that might harbor life? Is there another Earth out there? That's a big mystery. We don't know that just yet. And so um, I'll just give you a little teaser for tomorrow night's lecture. We are starting to detect planets around other stars. And this ugly thing is actually a star that's been uh, obscured by a special device called a coronagraph. It leaves a very noisy image of the stuff around the star and this ring here is actual dust around that star and in that ring there's actually a planet that's been imaged. So we're starting and that just came out this past year. So it's, it's a new art of actually finding planets around other stars and getting better and better at studying them. So, you know, here are questions, you know, what kinds of extrasolar planets are we finding? How are we doing it? How, what does that mean for our significance of human life if we find life, if we don't? What does significance actually mean? What will this do for our view of ourselves? It's going to be a very interesting discussion. So the commercial is to find out tomorrow night's lecture at 8 o'clock in the Modern Languages Theater. But I digress. Okay. So that was our little tour of the universe. And I want to, um, I'm going to go just slightly past nine here, but uh, can our observations of the universe tell us anything about the existence or nature of God? Now, this is a very uh, uh, interesting question that I don't often get to address in a scientific lecture because science is kind of limited to studying sort of the physical universe forces and things that science can measure. Science can't measure things that are of a spiritual nature. It's outside of the limits of science. It doesn't mean those questions aren't important. They're just uh, not 
generally addressable by science. But this lecture allows me to uh, talk about this uh, stuff, and, I, and I'm glad to be able to do that because these are the Pascal lectures on Christianity and the university. So let's think about this just a little bit. And again, uh, when I'm talking about this matter of things, I'm, I am generally representing my own musings on the subject. I'm not representing NASA's or anybody else's view. And I'm just happy to carry us along on this kind of conversation. Um, can the universe tell us anything about the existence or nature of God? There are different opinions on the answer to that question. John Calvin, theologian of the 16th century, certainly thought so. He said that astronomy is not only pleasant, but it's also useful to be known. He said it cannot be denied that this art unfolds the admirable wisdom of God. So even back then, and he didn't know what we were about to discover. This was back in the 16th century. So uh, he did, if he only knew what was coming, he would have been even more amazed. Astronomy has long been thought of as being inspirational. Others uh, come to a different conclusion. Um, Steven Weinberg, as he mused on the subject, he says the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. So in that sense, you know, you can come to different conclusions as you look at the universe, as you understand more and more of it. To some, the universe is appearing to expand into ever and ever coldness and bleakness as the long-term future. What is the point if that's all there is? What about the perspective of faith? Um, and in particular, in the theme of, of this Pascal series, how does a biblical or theistic view of the cosmos relate to a scientific view? And here we have to be careful. We have to remember that science is limited to questions of how and when and why in terms of physical cause and effect, while our faith perspectives take in other information that can help us address questions like, you know, why in terms of is there purpose and who, is there some sort of certain sort of divine cause behind this all. These are things sort of outside of science and it's not a good idea when these things get, these approaches get confused with each other, but I believe they can inform one another. Um, so given those cautionary notes, I'd like us to think just a little bit about, um, you know, does the character of the heavens reflect the character of their creator? If we allow ourselves to imagine just for a moment, that there might be a divine creator of the universe. What would the universe tell us, if anything, about the character of that divine creator or upholder or purpose behind it? And so I thought about that to, to some length, and, and I came up with this little, little list of my own. And you might come up with your own thoughts as well. So this is uh, not anybody's definitive list. It's sort of what come, came to my mind viewing this question. So from astronomical observation and the resulting inference, within this view of considering a divine creator a possibility, so we're, we're, we're considering this a possibility, then this God, this creator, would appear to me to be very powerful. We've seen some of the things already that are powerful. A creative, a creator and a lover of beauty. We've seen both the beauty of galaxies and nebulae and stars and the most interesting thing to me is the connection between that beauty and us being creatures here within this universe that can recognize that beauty. So the ability to us, for us to recognize this and for it to be there is an interesting connection. I'm told that our brains are sort of hardwired to recognize design and beauty and I think that there's, uh, there's, there's purpose in that. Um, patience. There's 13.7 billion years of history of the universe, as we can best guess right now. Now, you know, this God would have a different view of time and efficiency than we have. So we, we would say, you know, we gauge things by our lifespans. But uh, if that's not the important uh, feature here for this God, then this God is, would appear to us to be uh, patient, allowing things to unfold uh, according to processes that are needed to create the conditions that eventually would lead to life. Faithfulness, allowing these fundamental physical laws of, of, of the universe, of gravitation, and of time moving forward, these kinds of things don't jump around and change from moment to moment. So it allows for the, develop, the ordered development of the universe according to these fundamental physical laws. And yet within this context of faithfulness, we see a desire for freedom because there are 
uh, there are uh, elements of our universe setup that allow for freedom. We have uh, things such as chaos theory, quantum theory, so forth, that allows a sense of freedom within this ordered context. I believe that, that uh, con- that's related to perhaps our ability in our experiential sense to understand that there really are such things as pain and choices and good and evil, this kind of thing. And we obviously see that our universe enables life. So this God would be one who gives and enables life and enables a fruitful universe. We're here. There may be life elsewhere as, as well. And then I would, I would call this love. Uh, you know, that we are enabled to both investigate, appreciate, and also understand the magnificent cosmos of which we are a part. As more and more, we're seeing more and more of what's out there. So these are qualitative features that I would attribute that maybe, it's not a proof, there's no proof of any of these things through observational science, but I would say if you're going to think about this idea of there being a divine creator or purpose, you could see some of these qualities by looking at the universe in an astronomical sense. If we go specifically to scripture, what does it say? Well, you know, everyone jumps to Genesis, but if you look at the scriptures as a whole, There's sort of two themes, that God is responsible for the heavens and everything we find in nature. And the second theme is that God is pleased with discovery and with good stewardship, that we've been given dominion, for better or worse, over our planet at least, and responsibility for how we use that dominion, for good or or ill. Those are the two themes I see overall. And most of all, in in Christian and and Judeo-Christian scripture, the heavens are mentioned in terms of praise. So not in terms of scientific detail of how they got there. That's sort of, I believe, left as a gift for scientists to figure out. But in terms of praise, Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. There's other translations that say there isn't, they have no speech or language and their voice is not heard. And yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And I find this quite true. The, the, the stars aren't saying anything. The galaxies aren't saying anything. And yet by simply stargazing at night uh, from, from the backyard or by scientifically studying the heavens with telescopes, we're, we're hearing a message about the magnificence of the universe all over the world, all different cultures and languages. And to push this one step farther, this is a lecture series on Christianity in the universe. What, is there anything specific about Christianity in this whole uh, understanding that we can pull out of Scripture? And I would say, yes, there is. That according to Scripture... Christian scripture, the whole cosmos is both conceived and upheld by a living word. It's called the word. A person who relates to us in the presence and spirit of the one called Jesus the Messiah or Christos in New Testament scripture. So here we have a personal aspect of both the creation and the upholding of the universe. The opening verses of John say, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God and through him all things were made. In him was life and that life was the light of all people. It goes on to say that word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. This is an amazing passage. It basically says the word of God through whom the universe was made also became flesh and became part of the universe. And I think that is an amazing uh, Christian distinctive here. And again in Hebrews it says that this son of God through whom he made the universe is also the exact representation of God and sustaining all things. In some translations it says sustaining the universe by his powerful word. So we get the sense that Jesus was not just an afterthought that God sent to sort of help the struggling human beings who'd gone astray. He's also there in, in, in the sense of, of Christ's spirit from the very beginning and upholding the universe throughout time. So that's an aspect of Christian thought that I think is not often appreciated and, um, and it is relevant to our discussion tonight. <coughs> All right, so how do we respond and how should we respond? Well, I thought about that a little bit and I felt 
that for once I think we all feel a sense of wonder and awe and some of us feel a sense of giving praise to God or, or uh, we all feel some sense of wonder, I hope. If you don't feel a sense of some sort of wonder, I have failed tonight. Um, we should be reflecting on our place in the universe and I hope we have a sense of stewardship for our little planet to tend our garden and care for it and to care for all its inhabitants. If we do have dominion, we need to be careful that we take care of it and take responsibility for those um, who are, have less control over it than we do. And I'm talking about the animal world and the plant world and every, everyone who lives here. And I would also say exploration is important because exploration shows an appreciation for this universe, this creation, if you will, that we want to learn more about it. it, it, it you know, God didn't make it for nothing, right? So let's go out and explore. Uh, so I want to finish up with this theme of exploration. And I'm particularly fond of the Hubble Space Telescope. I've worked with the Hubble program for many years in different capacities. It's sometimes called the HST for Hubble Space Telescope. But I'm told that here in Canada, if I mention the HST, it doesn't go over so well. I don't quite understand that, but uh, so I'm going to be careful about calling it the HST. Um, I'm going to close here. I know I'm a few minutes over, but I just thought you might like to see a few highlights of the servicing mission. This past May, we sent astronauts up to the telescope for the final time to put in new instruments, new batteries, uh, new gyroscopes. They did a fantastic job over five days. And I uh, got to be a part of that because of my oversight role with the Hubble Space Telescope program. Um, these are a list, you don't need to know what these acronyms mean, but of new instruments and things that were installed on the telescope. These are our happy astronauts about to get on the shuttle and be blasted off into space, risking their lives to actually make the telescope uh, work for several more years. And um, I'll, let you, I'll let you see this launch if, if I can get this to work. Uh, do you want to see the launch? Yeah. All right, so I'm a few minutes over, so you asked for this, okay? <laughs> this, this takes about two, two and a half minutes or so. I filmed this myself, so I got to go to the launch because I was on the science team being able to uh, talk to reporters about the science that Hubble will do for us. And so they let me go to the launch, and I also got to work in the control room at Mission Control. So I had my little camera, with my little handheld thing, and it takes movies, and it takes surprisingly good movies. So this is my own little handheld camera, and you'll hear me, my voice, if, you, if the sound works, you can hear me saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, that's me, okay? <laughs> All right. So right back here is the launch pad, all right? Right in the distance. They don't let you get very close. This is the launch pad. That's me. That's me. There are seven people on top of this thing. That's me. That's the senior project scientist speaking behind me. Now you know why astronauts wear diapers. Wouldn't you need them? <laughs> that crackling sound is real. Now what we didn't know right then was that there were all sorts of alarms going on right about now in the shuttle itself. And the ground control had to decide whether those alarms were real and to try to do an aborted launch, which has never been successfully done, but to bring them back. Or whether the sensors were malfunctioning. And they did a very quick analysis and decided that the sensors were malfunctioning. But apparently it was quite tense in, in the shuttle for a few for a little while there. We didn't know that. Now about this point, these outer solid rockets fall off. But we couldn't see that because it was behind the clouds. These are some headquarters officials watching the whole thing. The chief of science. That's me. I have to be in my own film. How can I leave me out of my own movie? And that's the shadow of the, uh, of the plume there. So uh, 
This is an IMAX camera. You see the, the camera right there on this long boom is making an IMAX film of this whole servicing mission, and it will be released in March of this year. So you can see uh, on whole, in, in science museums and places where there are IMAX movies, you'll be able to see a film of this entire process. So I think that's about it for this. All right, wasn't that cool? Aren't you glad you saw that? There's only a few more shuttle launches left. I have a few more slides. I'll just go through them really quick. Here's an astronaut during the mission. So I went on down to Texas for this mission itself. And the astronauts, and you can see a reflection in this one's helmet, are now spending five days doing some very complicated tasks. They're pulling out old cameras. That's what this old thing is, and putting in new ones in their place. That's me in the mission control room where we would work 13-hour shifts and get to watch on this side what's actually happening on the space shuttle and this side what's supposed to be happening graphically, and hopefully they correlate. Um, <laughs> these are... <laughs> The astronauts doing some very complicated repairs. They had to take instruments that were never meant to be repaired in space, take off covers that were bolted on with hundreds of bolts and try to do that with thick gloves and, uh, and put in uh, new uh, uh, repaired electronic devices. And they had some troubles, but I'm thankful that that all went well. And now we are enjoying the new science from the new instruments, so just fantastic scientific returns. Um, beautiful uh, images. Of, they, they did some early release images just so people could see some of the quality. First thing we saw was a, a, a comet ramming into Jupiter. We thought 1994 was a very rare event when that happened. And then we saw it again in 2009, an impact on Jupiter. And keep in mind that this impact is about the size, you know, this is Earth. So it's a very large size of Earth. You know, we could get hit again too. So, um, so this is a, a sobering picture. Um, this is a, another star cluster, but I think you can see the very rich contrast in color here that the new camera, the wide field camera three provides, showing an extreme contrast between the reds and blues in this particular cluster. I think that's just a gorgeous, this was just a calibration image and it's just gorgeous. Um, here's a picture of a nebula where we can zoom in. This is sort of showing you where that constellation is. As you zoom in to a nebula of gas within this particular constellation, there's an active star forming zone as we get in, zoom in and in and in on this picture uh, and using the different wavelength ranges on this camera, you can actually see one of these pillars of gas where there's active star formation. It's again, you've seen these pillars before, but this one shows an interesting jet. And as you hone in in the infrared channel of this new camera, you can peer in and see the source protostar that's actually causing the ejection of this jet. When material infalls on the star, again, some of it gets caught up in the magnetic field and gets ejected. A beautiful capability of this camera to see everything from ultraviolet to visible to infrared wavelengths all in one camera. So here we go with the outer object and the inner object, uh, all due to the capabilities of this new camera. This is one of these nebulae, these old stars losing its outer atmosphere. They call it the butterfly nebulae. And I believe it's just a beautiful, beautiful object. An old star losing its outer atmosphere. Um, I'm going to try to finish up here. Eta Carina is an old star system losing its outer atmosphere through winds and spectral analysis using our repaired spectrometer, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, is showing the makeup of these winds as it spews out iron and nickel and other things into the surrounding medium. Eventually, this star will completely explode and all these heavier elements fused inside the star will be expelled into the surrounding medium. Um, I'm going to skip this because we're way over, but we can see this lensing effect. I think I told you um, that uh, galaxies in a background can get completely distorted and lensed by foreground clusters of galaxies. And this is one of those examples. Um, in fact, maybe I will let you see this. All right, if you'll forgive me. Right, we really are. I'm, I'm, I'm like three slides from the end. But gravity does bend light. Here's an example. This is the harbor in Baltimore. If you imagine a black hole coming between you and Baltimore, um, it would distort the light. As the light comes around that black hole, it actually distorts the image that you see behind it. Well, the same thing is true if you're on planet Earth or on the telescope looking at a distant galaxy. If there's something massive between you and that distant galaxy, it's going to distort the light. So um, here you have a cluster of massive galaxies. This, this light from a distant galaxy goes around that, gets bent by the mass through this gravitational lensing effect, 
And then because of that, that background galaxy gets distorted in its appearance. It, becomes, it looks like these large, funny, arc-shaped things. And that's called gravitational lensing, or it can distort the galaxy in different ways depending on what the foreground object looks like. Well, Hubble has seen this funny, funny spiral galaxy completely distorted by a foreground cluster. <coughs> looks like a large snake. Um, it's quite incredible to see this lensing at work. Another instrument on Hubble now is the, is the cosmic origin spectrograph, which is looking at very distant, bright galaxies called quasars. And by looking at the light as it comes through all that space between the, the distant universe and our current telescope, some of it will be absorbed by what we call the intergalactic medium that fills the space between galaxies, kind of like a spider web or a cosmic web. And by mapping out the, red, the different red shifts of hydrogen in this path all the way, we can map out exactly where that web uh, is, is situated, where there's matter, where there's not, and map out this entire web of material between galaxies uh, in the universe, mapping out the cosmic web. Here's what that looks like spectrally. You look at a distant quasar and you see absorption out of the light from intervening filaments of gas in the intergalactic medium. That's another ongoing science program with Hubble. And then finally, we're seeing very, very distant galaxies. Here's another d deep field, but now we have more um, infrared light from, that we, allows us to see even more distant galaxies than we've ever been able to see before, circled in green here. And you may not be able to, to see this, but these are different filters of light. And as you get uh, to redder and redder filters, the, the galaxies that are more and more distant <coughs> won't even show up. So these are what's called Z dropout galaxies that don't show up in this Z filter band, but they do show up in the Y, uh, J, and H. All this is showing you is that we're seeing galaxies now at the highest redshifts we ever have. The universe is 13.7 billion years old, and these galaxies were already formed within 800 to 900 million years of, since the beginning of, of the universe. So they're, they're very infant galaxies already formed. And these galaxies, which don't show up even in this Y filter, which is even more redshifted, indicate that they are at redshifts, what we call 8 to 8.5, which means they were in existence only 600 million years after the Big Bang, again, in a universe that's 13.7 billion years old. So these are truly, truly very infant galaxies that we're starting to see thanks to the new instruments on Hubble. Looking back at Earth, we see our very tenuous atmosphere um, around the Earth. It reminds us how fragile a planet that we live on and that we need to take care of it. Good resources. I recommend these books. The Language of God by Francis Collins. He's now the director of the National Institutes of Health and he used to direct the U.S. Human Genome Project. He writes a lot about seeing God's handiwork in the human genome. This book, Not Just Science, Questions Where Christian Faith and Natural Science Intersect, is a wonderful collection of chapters on different topics. And I wrote the chapter on astronomy and cosmology. And a copy has just been donated to the library here. I can't remember which library, but, uh, but you can, you can uh, see this. It's a wonderful study guide for individuals or groups. This is a wonderful collection of literature from throughout history on thinking about the universe and what it means for us philosophically. And then these two organizations I'm particularly fond of, the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation and the American Scientific Affiliation, which study the relationship of science and Christian faith. And I am the vice president of the American Scientific Affiliation. So I invite you to visit these websites and find resources in your own studies. This is our own little planet. Be appreciative of it. I'm going to close now. I'm sorry I've gone a little bit over, but I'm going to leave you with gifts. I have pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope and you can each have at least one. This is one of those uh, spires of gas where stars are forming. This is called uh, one of these stellar spires in the Eagle Nebula, although a different one than you usually see. And this is a beautiful spiral galaxy. In the back of these things, this is M101, it's called the Pinwheel Galaxy. The back of these things, it explains what they are. So you can have them and you can put them up on your wall and be continually amazed at the beauty and mystery of our universe. I'll leave them up here where you can pick them up. And I thank you very much and I'm open for questions now.
Okay, so as you heard, Jennifer is open for some questions, and we are prepared to take them. Yes. My question is, on the singularity of the universe, do you think that we live in a multi-universe? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. I understand your question. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, you shook your head. Yes, that's why. Well, I'm, I'm curious to know what your. Okay. Your thoughts on that. So the, the 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 sort of hot topic of the day in 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 some cos cosmology circles is whether or not our universe is the only one or is is one of many. And and I'm not an expert on this topic. Rob is, but uh, but I I have some problems with the idea. First of all, we can't ever actually do this observational test so it's more like a, a theoretical philosophical mathematical idea that's okay but it's just hard for an observational astronomer to find satisfaction in something that you couldn't actually truly sat and test to us in a satisfying way um, I also find it sort of it tests logic and in one sense it, it doesn't philosophically bother me because we have found many countless other galaxies and it didn't sort of throw us. We realized we're not the only star in the galaxy. Now we know we're not the only galaxy in the universe. We're not in the center of things. It didn't, it was, this is all very interesting development, but you know, our, our, for the most part, our theology has, has stood the test of time even when being taken from the center. I'll be talking about that tomorrow. What does it mean if we're one of many universes? Well, in that sense, you know, it, it doesn't, change much philosophically to me except it basically says we, we might live in a, in a more magnificent multiverse than we thought about there are others though who would say no no this is this is a very different beast because if you have a multiverse there are some constructs of this where every potential universe with different forces and different different potentialities must be happening out there somewhere so you have some universe out there where you know, we're having this lecture, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wearing red instead of, you know, beige or something. And so, you know, you have this sort of, these sort of issues where you have realities that are, are even more serious things than that, that are actually uh, uh, really challenge logic and reality. And, and I have trouble when you sort of take it to that extreme. So I don't know if there's a multiverse. Since you can't observe it, I don't even know how to ask the question you know, I'm, it seems I hear that it's mathematically and, and philosophically possible, and it's very popular in cosmological cir circles, but I think it's more brought up as an answer to this sort of uncomfortable situation for some that we find ourselves in, that our universe appears to be finely tuned for life. We have physical forces that allow our universe to develop in such a way that life can exist, complex life can exist and be sustained as we're enjoying it. Why is that? If these forces were just a little bit different, apparently that's not going to be possible unless we're just a random selection of a, of a very large number of, gal of universes that have a different assortment of, of fundamental forces and we just happen to be the lucky one here. And so it's almost like a, a philosophical... Um, desire to me than something that's been well thought through. But if you really want to have a good conversation on this, this is your multiverse man. <laughs> <laughs> next, next question. Yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned chaos here. Of course, it's the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. And that suggests a very small change could have massive potential changes that, that result from it. So this perhaps helps us interpret ourselves within this massive universe that it could be that we could have influences because of interconnections and so on we just can't understand and go beyond what, what we think we could do possibly now. So this goes to perhaps purpose. Uh, philosophers, theologians have been searching for what purpose God uh, has for us and for the living cosmos if, if you like. Well it seems God is silent and we haven't heard him yet. So, we're very inventive. Uh, what is wrong with us tenderly proposing certain purposes and trying them out, such as, for example, the evolution of consciousness? Would you see this being problematic from any perspective of us proposing? Because we need a sense of direction. We're like Brownian movement. You know, and the faster we go, the harder we get to go on. So, really, we need a better sense of direction. So, are you saying, what is there a problem with... with 
um, coming up with an idea like the evolution of consciousness to explain. And then we work with that. We iterate with it. Well, I, yeah, no, I don't see it. I think that, uh, you know, contemplating our our potential purpose and so forth is, 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 is a good thing. That sort of seems to, we seem to all want to understand you know, if there is a purpose and so forth. However, I would, I, I, I personally might take issue with your statement that God has never spoken because I think there's, there are, um, there are evidences that people take very strongly to say that God has spoken. Maybe not in, in um, audible words to everyone, but but you can see some people see what we've seen tonight to be, you know, in some sense, a message that God has spoken through beauty. God has spoken through order. God has spoken through um, our very ability to, to have these conversations. Um, and then we have more specific revelations if, uh, uh, where people believe that God has spoken through prophets. God has spoken through scripture. God has spoken through the coming of Jesus Christ. God has spoken through love. Um, you know, these are things that are hard to measure scientifically, but you can measure some of these things historically and then some of them experientially. So I'm not sure I would agree with you that that everyone would agree that God has not spoken. You but I, about yeah. Purpose, sense of direction. Well, and in some and. And so if you believe in some of those ways of God speaking, that does give us a sense of purpose and direction. But you can also, I think, explore these other, uh, uh, other modes as well. You know, this sort of emerging understanding, I would say, of, of our sense of being, our sense of consciousness. Um, b- by all means, I would say explore all of these things. So, yes. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Right. So, so 13.7 billion years is pretty much the accepted um, age. It's, a, it's quite amazing that we can do the 0.7. You know, we actually kind of, you know, that's kind of astounding. But um, that that comes through uh, uh, looking both at the sort of history of the expansion of the universe and kind of replaying it back, and also looking at this cosmic microwave background radiation, which actually gave us a much better handle on on the age of the universe question. So scientifically, I don't hear a lot of debate on that. Uh, but you're asking a different question, which is how do you interpret scripture? So, and I take I take personally take scripture very seriously. Um, and so, what was you know what was God trying to tell us about the history of creation through scripture? And it's true that if you count back the generations of people that are described in the Old Testament, and you take it back to Adam and Eve, who are described as the first people, and then if you add on to that six literal days to be the creation, it gives you something on the order of a few thousand years. And that's problematic because it's very difficult. to It's impossible to reconcile that with what we're sort of seeing in the universe. So what does that mean? You know, is, is our scientific interpretation wrong? Or is the biblical account wrong? And I would say that it's neither that the biblical account is wrong nor that the scientific uh, account is wrong, but that maybe our interpretation of Scripture needs to be very careful to make sure we're getting the message that God was trying to get through. And in those original Scriptures, uh, it was not a scientific text. The people that were receiving that at the time of Moses would not have understood 13.7 billion years. They did understand that it was saying that God was responsible for this ordered, observable nature that they see around them Um, and it's quite incredible actually the parallel of that scripture with what we see scientifically we see light we see darkness we see oceans and continents we see fish and birds mammals and eventually humans Um, it's quite incredible in that sense and it's also incredible in the sense that this people group received a message about observable things in nature rather than fanciful gods fighting against one another which was often the case in different other cultures and so forth. And in this story, you actually had the sense that God was the one to be worshipped and everything in nature was a creation of God, but not to be (laughs) worshipped. I am serious that interstellar travel is not 
possible now. Yes. <laughs> Unless you know something I don't know. No, 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 no